Hey, I'm Brother Taylor Lindeman, pastor at First Baptist Church in Brooklyn, Mississippi. We're so glad you joined us online today for this sermon. You can find additional sermons at these online sources. I hope that the sermon today speaks to you, and we pray that God will move through it. Open your Bibles with me to Psalm 51. How would it be amiss if I did not at least say something today about the date? September 11th, and it is 21 years after that fatal attack on U.S. soil, 9-11. And there is many emotion, and we could talk for a long while about the significance of that date and the memories and emotions that come with it. But I think in going with the sermon title and um, realizing one of the positive effects, if there's any positive effect from a tragedy, God works good and even the worst of things, he still gets the glory, is that after 9-11, there was a great revival. I don't know if you remember it. I was a little young. You can probably have guessed as you were probably trying to put together, does Brother Taylor even remember 9-11? But after that fatal tragedy, there was a great revival in the United States. And as we begin this morning and through the next three weeks, working up to our own revival here at First Baptist Church, Brooklyn, um, that is where my mind goes on a date like today, looking at, yes, the bad, but also the good that comes from it. And revival is going to be here at First Baptist Brooklyn. Brother Ben Skipper of Carterville is going to come and be our evangelist on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, September 26th through the 28th. And for the next three weeks, I want to turn our hearts and our minds towards that. Because many of us, we may say, you know, I, I'm in a good place. I don't know that I necessarily need revival. I don't know if I need three additional sermons in a week. Many of us might say that, you know, our church is, is going great. We've got a lot of good things that are happening. We've got people who have joined almost every single week. I don't know, Brother Taylor, if that's, you know, what we need right now. But I think... All of us at every time in our lives need to recognize, and this is what Psalm 51 is about, is about how we must have revival. We need revival. We need this intimacy with the Lord. And I think some practical reasons that you need revival is because, uh, number one, um, Brother Taylor doesn't like to take days off. And that leads to, you don't ever hear from anybody but me. And I should get an amen from this one. You need to hear somebody other than me. There we go. I'm tired of that preacher. There was your opportunity. You had an option. You got, the, you got the opportunity and you didn't use it. So I need you to come and hear from a pastor who poured into me for a year while I was on his pastoral staff at Carterville, who is, if, I, if you think I'm an animated preacher, boy, is he an animated preacher. You need to come and hear from somebody other than me, get poured into. And for me, why does Brother Taylor need revival? Isn't he the spiritual giant in the room? No, sir. What I need is I need to sit in a pew and need to be poured into for three days. That's what I need. That's what you need as well. What else do we need? We need to take advantage of the move of God that's amongst us. You know, I, the Lord burdened my heart. I remember me and Cliff were up here. Cliff was doing work, and I was he was he was vacuuming the, the carpet or something on one of those cleanup days. And I was up here gabbing. What the preacher does on the work day is he works this right here. And I, I'm all my thoughts are going. I got enough people in one church building, and I can start thinking about what's going on. And it was back. It was April or May sometime. And I said, Cliff, th things are things are going good, and I just feel that the Lord is leading us to revival in this season. I think it's a good time in our church, not just because seasonally it's appropriate or because we haven't had one in a long time, but because right now we feel the Spirit of God moving amongst us and we need to take advantage of that because we need to recognize that God is doing something and we need to just lay it all out before Him and reap the spiritual benefits that come from pouring everything out before the Lord. Will it be a tough week? Yes, it will. <laughs> I, I already spend how many days at the church, Brother Taylor? I, I know you pain. I spend them up here too. Add two more to it. Lord have mercy. You're going to get benefits from it. You're, you're going to be spiritually revived. You're going to have a life poured back into you. And so how can you help as we approach revival at the end of this month? The first thing I'm going to ask of you to do is I'm going to ask you to pray for it. 
If you have not already begun to pray for it, I want you to begin praying right now, daily, as often as you think about it, up until throughout revival. Pray. What are we praying for? We're praying that God will move. We're praying that people will join us. We're praying that this place will be packed. I mean, it is so exciting every Sunday when we come out here and we look at how many spots or only so many are available in our sanctuary that we're getting pretty packed in here. I would love to see there's standing room. We got to go overflow into the fellowship hall. Why? Because that is, we, we feel the spirit of God here. And I want other people to feel this as well. What else can I ask of you? I want you to come. I know you're going to say, well, on Monday nights, I got this. On Tuesday nights, I got this. Well, I've, I've planned that this is what I'm going to do on these days. And it just so happens that I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it, Brother Taylor. I want you to make an effort. If you get off so late that you can't come, but to listen to the preacher, come. If you can't get, if you get off so late that you think I'm going to walk in in the middle of the invitation, that's okay too. Come be a part of it. Come invite as well. That's another thing you can do. The the reason our church is growing is not because there's a good preacher. It's not because there's a good music minister. It's not because we're friendly folks. It's not because we eat a lot. Hey, Amen. Why are we growing? It's because we've got people who see that the Lord is moving here and are inviting others to take part in that. Let's do that for revival. Not to have a packed out room, not because we're going to pass the plate. I made a point to tell Brother Ben, Brother Ben, I'm not taking up a love offering for you. Here, here's exactly how much we're, we're going to do for this, this revival because it's not about money. It's about hearts in Brooklyn, one to know the Lord. And he agreed. He said, let's do it. This is a, a revival that is not about uh, that we should get a whole bunch of people in here, that we should have uh, a plate passed and make some money, that we should be proud of ourselves, but we should be proud of the Lord and that we should come here expectant that he's going to do something. And so this morning, as we study, I'm going to take Psalm 51 and I'm going to apply it to personal revival. Stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, as we look at Psalm 51 in its entirety in a sermon entitled, Preparing for Personal Revival. Hear now the words of the living and true God. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightst be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall chew forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we prepare individually for revival this morning, we pray asking that you would just pour out your grace, your presence, your mercy, your blessings upon this place. That as we prepare for such a move of God, that it would happen even now in our own hearts as we ready ourselves for it. 
Lord, I pray that as we look at our own sinfulness this morning, as we look at how you might correct us in revival, Lord, I pray that you would do all these things in readying us to reach the community around us. Lord, I pray that you would build us up even in the midst of our sin. Lord, I thank you for all that you've done in our church and what you're doing even now. And I ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Recognizing one's sinfulness is the first requisite for salvation. You can't know that you need to be saved and you can't call out for salvation unless you recognize what you need to be saved from. I often, with children in my office, when we have that salvation conversation, I give them the analogy of a person in a pool. Kids love to swim in pools. And uh, if they were anything like me, they were an okay swimmer. And if they were anything like Adrian, they were probably a bad swimmer. And they understand the analogy. Oh, I just threw you out there, baby. I'm sorry. The analogy is a person swimming in the pool. They begin to sink to the bottom. And the lifeguard on duty dives in, brings them out of the waters, puts them on the side of the pool, and gives them mouth-to-mouth, gives them CPR, revives them. That person just got saved from the watery death that they were about to have. So when you tell me you're going to get saved, what are you getting saved from? You're not drowning in a pool. What has Jesus saved you from? That's the analogy I typically give because we have to recognize there's something that I need to be saved from. There's something just like the swimmer in the pool who as he drowns, he recognizes this is something that is going to harm me. If I don't take care of this now, I'm going to be in trouble. It's not water though. It's sin, that is, that thing that is creeping up on us, giving way to death, giving way to hell, and all of these things are what we need saving from. And as we look this morning at Psalm chapter 51, we begin with the dedication. You might notice that it doesn't look like it's verse 1. It's astracized here in, uh, in our, our screen. But many times, uh, don't be fooled by your Bibles not putting the one right there. The dedication is actually a part of the original Hebrew text. This is actually God's word as well. And it gives us context for why David is writing this psalm. What is it all about? The dedication says this. It's to the chief musician. It's a psalm of David. And when did it happen? When was it written? When Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. I don't think anyone needs reminding of this grave sin of David's. This man of God who had the own heart of God and the mind of God that he would be this great king of Israel. But look at how far he's fallen. And his context here is this is his adulterous sin with Bathsheba. This is the context of the sin that he cries out for in the first five verses here. And I think this is important because whether we're in grave sin like David or this morning we find ourselves forgetting that we have sin, either way, we need to be reminded again and again that we are a sinful people, that we need God, and that He is coming to us not in the midst of our good works, not in the midst of a time where we don't need Him, but all the while, every time we encounter this God who is holy and righteous and true, He is finding us in the midst of our sin. And therefore, we should call out, as the psalmist does, beginning in verse 1, David says this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. This word in the Hebrew, loving kindness, is chesed. It is this love that is a covenant type of love, a love that is outside of any conditions, that finds us in the midst of our sinfulness. This is what God calls out and he says, God have chesed upon me. Love me unconditionally, even though I am a sinner who the conditions say should be cast into hellfire, who should be unforgiven, who should know better. Lord, will you love me right now? This is how David calls out to God. And he calls out to him, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Here we have in verse 1, the power of God's covenant love and mercy. In verse 2, it reminds us he's the only one who can take care of it. He's the only one who can, as David says in verse 1, blot it out. Verse 2 says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. God is the only one who can do that. God is the only one who can wash off the stink and the dirt and the nasty that comes with all the sins that we have. He's the only one who can handle that. Verse 3 continues. This is what we almost do. 
and salvation and daily, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. It was ever before David in this hour. In his worst sin, it was staring him right in the face. And he can help, but not, he cannot help but acknowledge his sins. I did it. I was wrong. And the reality is, church, this is what we need to do. We need, again, like at the very beginning of our salvation, when we acknowledge that we needed a Savior to save us, we need right now, before revival, but every day as we wake up and we see His mercies anew, we need to recognize His mercies do nothing for us if we don't recognize that He is being merciful on us, that we have sin that needs forgiving. We need to acknowledge once more, I'm a sinner. I need help. I've wronged you, Lord, and I've wronged others. And the only person who can take care of this is you. Because if you don't, verse 4 tells us, who have we sinned against? Against thee, thee only. Against God, David says, have I sinned. But we recognize, even the dedication recognizes, who did he sin against? That's Sheba's husband. Nathan is the one that he sinned against. But he says, I sinned only against God. We don't recognize often enough that every single thing that we do, the little white lie all the way to the worst of the worst sins, are not only sins against others, but more importantly, they're sins against a holy and righteous God. That's what makes them so dangerous. That's why James says that our lust gives birth to sin and our sin gives birth to death and our death gives birth to hell. That all of these things are like cascading dominoes that one leads to the other and it's that dangerous. Why? Because it's against a holy and righteous God. That's it. And verse five shows us where we find ourselves if we don't call on this God. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. We're trapped in this sin. And the only person who can help us out of it is not being born in a different body. Oh, many a kid will tell Mr. Lindemann, oh, if only I was like them. If only I had a mom. If only I had a home life. If only I didn't have brothers who hated me. If only I didn't have this, that, and the other. No, you'd still be a sinner. If only I was just a better person and I could pull myself up on my own bootstraps and overcome this sin. You can't. You never will. The only way that you're going to overcome your sin as someone who is born in sin, who has been born into this iniquity, is only by the washing, verse 2 tells us, of a holy and righteous God. What does this have to do with me, Brother Taylor? It has to do with you, because you might sit here, you might look at the bulletin up until this point and say, revival's coming up and I can commit to Wednesday. I can commit to Monday. But there's other things that are going to have to get in the, in, in the middle of this. Things that if I really put my mind to it, if I really decided I needed it, I might be able to go. But I'm not going to put it as a priority on my life because I don't think I need revival. I don't think I need the Lord to liven me up once again because I think I'm pretty on fire for him right now. You're lying to yourself. And your lies are going to get you into trouble because guess what? Each and every single one of us needs to be revived again. Every single one of us needs to recognize, as David is recognizing in these five verses, that my sin has separated me from a holy God. And if I don't get a hold on it now, and if I don't run back to him now, and if I don't ask for forgiveness right now, it's going to continue to divide me. And I'm not here this morning to make you sad and upset and man, that, that pastor, he's, he's pestering me to go to revival. That's, that's not my purpose this morning. My purpose is to show you you need it. In the same way that every single time that I stand up here, I tell you about how we've got service on Wednesday nights, and we've got service on Sunday nights, and we've got things throughout the week, and we've got Sunday school at 10 o'clock because we need the fellowship of other believers. We need the pouring out of the Spirit of God upon us by His Word. We need to gather together and pray. We need to gather together and have fellowship in unity together. We need to observe the ordinances of baptism and of the Lord's Supper. We need all these things, church. Why? Because I am a dead sinner. And I'm in dire need of fellowship with a righteous God. And he's established this, that we might have that. This morning, I'm telling you, as we approach revival, we have to acknowledge we need it first. 
This is not a gathering where we say, well, we're going to send out flyers. That's what we're going to do. We're going to send them out in the mail. You're going to get them next, not next week, but the week after that probably. It's going to go to every mailbox in Brooklyn. And and we might go out and we might knock on doors and tell everybody they need to come to our revival. And I want you to go out in the highways and the byways and the hilltops. And I want you to go and I want you to tell everybody there's a revival at Brooklyn and you need to come check it out because God's on the move. You can benefit from this. Come on. This is for the community. That's what I want you to say. But it's not just for the community. It's not just to be mailed out to the community. It's not just for us saintly people to go knock on the doors and to say, come to our revival. But it's for us. We need it as much as anybody else. Some of us are burnt out from years of service. Some of us have been attacked of the devil as of recently because I told you it was going to happen as the church started to grow, as things started to go right, as God started to smile and to bless us with spiritual blessings. I told you. The devil's going to come. And some of us have been knocked down. Some of us have been beat up. We need revival. We always need it, but all the more right now. And if you've already made up your mind that you don't need it, that you won't make it a priority, you're not understanding it correctly. Every hour I need you. Not just when I think I need you. Not just when I've been bad. No, but Lord, every hour. I need you. Let's take advantage of this move of God and in understanding and preparing personally for revival, recognize this is for me. For revival to begin, we must prepare ourselves by recognizing our sin. But a mere recognition of sin isn't enough. Look with me at verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Somebody asked me the other day, I told them I had, they, they said, where, well, where, where's mama at? I was toting the baby around early in the morning on Sunday morning. And I said, oh, I got her in there working on the PowerPoint, doing, doing my secretarial work and ha- handling all that for me. And they said, oh, you've got her trained up real nice. And, you know, I wasn't going to say it in front of her, but I said, yes, sir, I sure do. You know, it kind of goes the other way, though. <laughs> Most of the time, I recognize how well she's got me trained that uh, I make sure when I come home, I, I go straight to, straight to the crib because I got to take over from her shift that just got finished. I need to clock in and get busy. I, I know that I better not ask um, if there's any garlic bread that's going with my spaghetti because, baby, this spaghetti is just good how it was. You didn't forget nothing with that, baby. I, I have to make sure that if she says she wants to go out to eat, I don't say we don't have money. I say wherever you want to go. She's got me trained up pretty good. But, you know, the training of husband and wife, the training of your spouse, you can't teach an old dog all the new tricks. Can I get an amen from, from somebody who's got experience in the house? Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, Adrian can try all she wants, but there's, gonna, there's still going to be my flaws and my imperfections and just the way I've always done things, Danny. Uh, it just sometimes you can't teach the old dog new tricks. And the reality is the corrective nature of the husband and wife relationship, it, it's, it's not perfect. They're, they're, we're always going to bicker about the same things we bicker about. We're going to get better at bickering. We're probably going to learn to shut up. We're probably going to learn to get over it. But we're going to bicker about the same things we've always bickered about. But there's a corrective power that's way greater than Adrian has upon me. And it's the corrective power of Christ that can take someone who is dead in their sins and trespasses and transition them, change them completely, evolve them into a saint of God. And the next six verses here in Psalm 51 Look at, it's not just the sinful nature that we need to acknowledge, but we need to acknowledge that God is in the corrective business and that he can change those things about us that mama can't change, that your wife can't change, that your friends, whether whether good or bad, your pastor even, can't change. God can change those things. The first thing that we look at here in verse 6, what can God change? He can change our acknowledgement of the truth in our inward parts. He can make known to us those things in wisdom that are hidden from our eyes. He can open them that we might see. Why should I come to revival? Because you need to be receptive to the truth and the wisdom of God. This is where it happens. And when the Spirit moves and when He speaks to His people, we hear Him more clearly. 
When we open our hearts, acknowledging our fallenness, coming ready to receive what he's got for us. Mike said it the other day when he was announcing, it was probably a month ago, but I remember it. He said, well, it doesn't really matter what our good pastors decided he's going to preach to us today, because if you're not ready to receive it, you're going to get nothing out of it. But if you have a heart that is ready to receive what I'm giving to you this morning, then you're going to receive it and God's going to do a mighty work in it. If we're, recept- if we're ready to receive, God will make that receptivity, that truth here, that wisdom here. It'll turn it on for us that we're ready to receive what he's got. Verse 7, what else is God going to do? He's going to do what no other can. Verse 7, he's going to purge me with his son, and I shall be clean. How clean? Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. I was talking to the kids who got baptized. Uh, Heidi and Justin the other day, and uh, they had to put on those funny clothes, those those robes. They didn't get to wear uh, Brother Taylor's interesting pants. <laughs> they they didn't get to wear my waders, but they did get to wear that white gown. And I said, "What do y'all think it means that we we're wearing white? Why do you think we have to wear a white robe for this?" And somebody's been teaching them good in Wednesday nights and in children's church and in Sunday school because they said it's pure. It shows that we've been clean, shows that we've been washed whiter than snow. Only the blood of Jesus can do that. If we're ready to receive it, if we acknowledge we have sin, God is going to wash us, purify us whiter than snow. But I think one that we all need is verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which hast broken may rejoice. I don't know about you, but it's I, I'm, I'm a big baby when I'm sick. I milk it. I make sure that Adrienne knows how uncomfortable and how sad and how need, in need of a nurse I am because I hurt. I've, and I've never even had anything as bad as a broken bone. But I can imagine those with broken bones here, how in pain they must be. What does he say to God? Make me to hear joy and gladness instead. Change my attitude, Lord, that when I see the dark and hurtful things of this life, that I can look and fixate on your joy and your goodness. Help me to do that when we're in the presence of God, when we've acknowledged we have sin, when we're ready to receive his truth. Guess what? He is going to change our attitude. And many of us, I can tell you because this is the season we're in as a church, we need an attitude adjustment. We need an attitude adjustment as we deal with the things that are going on in our church, as the devil strikes us. We need an attitude adjustment as we might gossip in the back rooms. We need an attitude adjustment as we transition to what God is doing here and now. We need to look at the negative things. I preached it not so long ago, the problems of a growing church. We need to look at those things and we need to see the joy and the gladness and the goodness of God in its place. Verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. We need to put off the sin that stands in our way. We need to forget it. It's hard to get over our sins sometimes. We relish in our pit of despair that God knows our sin and sees our sin. And guess what? We need to just do as God has done and to separate our sins. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We need to take on the new man, recognizing that God is in the corrective business, that he can change what no other can change. And verse 11 and 12, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. What do we need in revival church? We need to be reminded of the salvation we once had. We need to be reminded of what God has already done. We need to be drawn back into his presence once again. If we're going to allow personal revival to take hold, we have to be willing to recognize our sinfulness, but also to allow God to go through his corrective process upon us. We are all sinners. We all need to change. And finally, when we have undergone this, when we're ready for personal revival, then, and I'm going to feed you today, so you're going to have to bear with me because I'm looking at that time and you might be looking at your watch and I'm I'm going to get there in a minute, but I'm going to give you a chicken leg at the end of it. We will be used for his witness at the end of all of that. 
I have prayed since I've become pastor. I remember in 2019 when I became pastor, I said, Lord, I I want this church to grow. I want to see this church on fire for you. Lord, I want to see people get saved. Lord, I haven't had enough opportunities to sit in my office and to talk to some young person, to some old person, and to say, Here's what the Lord can do in your life. Would you like to get saved? I haven't seen enough of that, Lord. That's what I want to do is I want want to see you, Lord. I want to see you working. And then I was the only person on staff for a little while. And then COVID happened just a month or two after that. And then we went through all sorts of changes and transitions. And it felt like on every cusp of everything that happened, I was like, Lord, is it time yet? And he'd say, not yet. Is it time now? Not yet. Is it time now? Not yet. But God is steady saying, instead, fix this first. Fix this first. When when you want to see this grow, Taylor, you're going to fix this first. Do this little task, and then you'll see it. And church, I think we're all in the same place I was, because I can see the look on your face as people walk. I can see the look on your face as events go successfully. I, I can see the look on your face when you look out and you say after service, wow, there was a lot of visitors here today. I can see your excitement for growth. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord told me. You got to fix you first. You got to fix it first. You're not going to get to take part in the glorious things that God is doing until you fix this first. Verse 13. Then, after what? After I've acknowledged my sin, after I've let the corrective process of the Lord take hold of my life, then... Will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee? Then we'll see the joys of conversion when we've dealt with us first. Verses 14 and 15. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And then what? My tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. When we let... God acknowledge the sin in our lives and correct the sin in our lives, then we'll be ready not only to convert the sinner, but also to give him the proper worship that he is due. I don't think any of us who would call ourselves a Christian want to withhold that from God, but the only way it can happen is this way. Finally, verses 16 through the end. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure and design. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Before we can give and offer the hearty sacrifices of God, the bull, the ram, the real meaty sacrifices before God, what does he desire first? Verse 17, a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart. Before God can uh, can work through you that you might do the big stuff for him, you've got to fix this in here. You've got to offer all that you have before him. That's what you place on the altar first. Then God will be pleased with the hearty sacrifices. This morning, I wonder, are you personally prepared for revival? Have you come before God needy and broken, ready to acknowledge sin, ready to say, I need correction? Or are you someone who says, I don't need that. They need that. Outside of these walls needs that. If we're to prepare for revival church, it means that as a church, whether in our seats or whether at this altar, we come and we say, I acknowledge my sinfulness. I acknowledge my wrongdoing. I need to change. I I don't need anybody to know my business. I don't need any of that. But Lord, I want to acknowledge before God, before church, before my family, before my brothers and sisters in Christ that I have sinned and I am needy for you because you're the only one who can wash it. Maybe some of us, we need to let the corrective process of the Holy Spirit take hold because we've been pushing back for far too long and saying, well, I'm not ready for that quite yet. And maybe for some of us this morning, preparing for personal revival means being obedient to God, being obedient to God in baptism, being obedient to God in membership, being obedient to God in just saying before the church family, I have fallen, I've backslidden, and I need to rededicate my life. And maybe that step of obedience is the best one ever. It's saying yes to God for the very first time, saying, I want to know him as my Lord and Savior. There's your opportunity for invitation this morning. Would you stand with me as we make those decisions, singing, only trust him.
Thank you for joining us online today. Remember, you can find additional videos at these online locations. If you would like to give, you can mail your offering to First Baptist Church Brooklyn at P.O. Box 340 in Brooklyn, Mississippi, 39425. If you would like to talk to someone, you can call our church number or you can visit us for one of our in-person worship times. We hope to see you soon.